Good morning. Uh, thank you, Eric. Um, and thank you for sparing everyone the length of my bio, which uh, it's a testament to old age, just gets longer and longer. Um, it, it is really terrific to be here, and it's particularly terrific to be real um, and to see so many old friends. And I want to thank my former boss and Council of the Americas, Chairman John Negroponte, uh, President Susan Siegel, and Vice President Eric Farnsworth for all of their work in putting together this 42nd conference. Um, but more than that, even the work that they do all year long, uh, we're so pleased to be partners in this event. The Deputy Secretary, who is always a tough act to follow, uh, gave us a strategic overview of the Americas uh, and our policies, which really is an ideal segue into a discussion of the Sixth Summit of the Americas in Cartagena. This summit highlighted so much of the positive and dynamic change that has been transforming the Americas since the first summit in 1994 in Miami. The Secretary observed in Cartagena that the entire political, cultural, and economic landscape of the Americas has changed profoundly in these short 18 years. The summit also had its frustrating moments, and I want to talk about them too, because they illustrate the areas in which work is still needed. But let me focus on the broad story first. To evaluate the summit, we need to start by zooming out beyond the painstaking procedural preparations, as important as those are. We had a very talented team working on that for many months and through the summit itself, led by Ambassador Carmen Lomelin, who's here with us today. Let's focus for a minute on some of the amazing images from the summit of an incredibly diverse group of Democratic leaders from every corner of the hemisphere sitting down together, publicly and privately, of talking with remarkable candor about the things that matter most to their people, usually in very down-to-earth and pragmatic terms, and focusing on cooperation that is playing out in real life throughout the hemisphere. And there's one important way in which form was critical to this summit the Colombian government's decision to hold, in addition to the usual governmental leaders' events, a private sector forum and one encompassing civil society, and I think it was an outstanding model for future events. Looking at the CEO summit in Cartagena, which was an event that highlighted the private sector's role in driving so many positive developments in the region, it was really one of the summit's highlights for President Obama. There was a remarkable discussion there among President Santos, President Rousseff, and President Obama, leaders of, the th of three of the most dynamic, most of the, the most dynamic countries in the region, getting down to brass tacks about the difficulties of the world economy and the fundamental challenges that we all face. These leaders dug into what it will take to realize the opportunities we have today, to build more successful and more just societies. Just a couple of examples. High standard trade agreements such as we now have with both Colombia and Panama. Cooperation on challenges such as energy, not just with words, but with real deeds such as Connect 2022, the electrical grid integration initiative. Significantly upping our game on education so the Americas can have the best trained workers, scientists and entrepreneurs from all backgrounds. Expanding exchanges within the Americas under President Obama's 100,000 Strong for the Americas to build the human capital we need to thrive. And here, there is an opportunity and a demand for creative public-private partnerships in a way that advances your interests and those of other stakeholders. And I hope every one of you will embrace that opportunity to increase exchanges for effective and transparent governance with strong democratic institutions based on key principles that are so very critical to economic growth and social opportunity. The leaders also talked in very frank terms about violence, crime, and drugs, how much we are doing together in so many new ways to counter those scourges. But the conversations also showed how far we have all moved away from one-dimensional focus on law enforcement. The President repeatedly underscored social and public health dimensions and shared responsibility that we have for all facets of the problem. Yes, he was clear that his administration does not think legalization is the answer to drugs. 
But there was wide recognition by virtually all leaders that this is not a silver bullet. The President was equally clear that we have to be open to looking at all the evidence and having an honest debate about how to deal with these issues and to know that they cannot be dealt with in isolation. Most leaders outlined unprecedented commitment and cooperation all over the hemisphere to improving the rule of law, opposing transnational crime, strengthening institutions and community resilience, and advancing prevention strategies. Cooperation in the past was often U.S. driven and bilateral. Today, it takes the form of direct cooperation among countries, sharing experience, know-how, and directly supporting each other. And these are incalculably positive, positive developments. All these themes resonated throughout the summit. The President had lots of time to listen and to engage with the region's leaders. And while there was a great deal of common ground among the leaders on these issues, there was not always unanimity. And sometimes there were discordant notes. That is hardly unusual. This is not a Warsaw Pact meeting from 1980. There are some who see the solutions differently. And that may impede language and declarations or pronouncements. But what it can't do is prevent the kind of advances in concrete cooperation that modern, successful, democratic societies are eager to have. And so you can honestly characterize the conversations and the summit as forward-leaning. And I know that sounds at times like a platitude, but Cartagena was overwhelmingly about 21st century partnership between and among neighbors who know, as the President said, that we will rise or fall together and that that narrative is not about imposing influence or dictating terms. It's about creating partnerships that better people's lives every day. The various initiatives that countries launched or highlighted at the summit tracked the themes that permeated the conversations to connect the Americas, as the Colombian so aptly titled it. I've already mentioned two of the most important, Connect 22 and 100,000 Strong in the Americas. A few more examples. President Obama proposed a broadband partnership of the Americas to promote universal access to technologies that will improve our region's competitiveness and foster social inclusion. The Small Business Network of the Americas, linking 2,000 small business development centers in the hemisphere and the 2 million clients they serve to make dreams a reality and create jobs in the United States and in the region. We Americas, an innovative public-private partnership that provides women entrepreneurs access to better training in fundamental business practice, practices and more access to markets and financing. And following up on the summit's civil society dialogue, the Secretary reaffirmed our commitment to social inclusion and equality, strengthening work with civil society and private sector partners to promote racial, ethnic, and gender equality and facilitate opportunity for historically marginalized populations. Now there were how do I put this diplomatically, some strategic communications challenges at the summit. And there were some who were quick to call the summit a failure when leaders didn't reach consensus on several points in the draft political declaration. Going in, we knew that Cuba and the Falklands Malvinas would be difficult issues, and we worked hard to try to bridge those gaps. We reached agreement on 16 paragraphs of text, but not on the remaining three. And these weren't things that could be papered over. So we had no declaration. But it does not lessen those 16 paragraphs of agreement on so much. Let me add a, a point about Cuba. We have a positive policy, one that seeks to support Cubans' rights to freely determine their own future. The administration has done a great deal to ease travel restrictions and increase the flow of information for ordinary Cubans. And we will be the first to cheer as a democratically chosen government in Cuba resumes its full participation in the inter-American system. But you all know that we aren't there yet. This region has a long consensus that participation hinges on adherence to democratic norms and principles. Personally, I found it disappointing at times that some countries whose democratic transitions have been so central to their own national success and who are stalwart in their support for rights and democracy on the global stage wavered in this case. We have a general concern about an erosion in full respect for freedom of expression in our hemisphere. 
During the remarkable transitions from dictatorship to democracy, which took place over the last 40 years, our region's free press, press has played essential roles. From La Prensa's principled defiance of abuses from the right and the left in Nicaragua, to the courageous journalists of El Espectador, who exposed links between narcotics traffickers and politicians in Colombia, to today's valiant bloggers and journalists in Mexico, journalists in this region have been protagonists of democracy. We have also developed institutions unique in the world to protect and defend freedom of expression. Given this distinguished record, it is particularly painful to see steps backward, whether by governments or non-governmental actors. Dissent is not criminal behavior. Opposition to the government is not criminal behavior. And free speech is not criminal behavior. To the contrary, free speech is one of the pillars of our democracies. There is an organic link between openness in the public square and electoral process and the durability and sustainability of economic prosperity. Standing up for and working hard for a level playing field in that public square, in the judicial arena, and in political processes is something that directly benefits the vast majority of U.S. and other companies that are good corporate citizens and play by the rules. And democratic principles remain critically relevant to the hemisphere, its challenges, and future success. But in the end, this summit is not about one or two issues, however significant. The summit is about the quality and candor of our leaders' discussions, and it's about the hemisphere's accelerating record of cooperation and integration. Those are meaningful metrics for judging the summit, and in this case, they tell a pretty compelling story. We are not a static hemisphere, thank God. We are all grappling with big changes in the region and in the world and in our own countries, including the need to update institutions and processes to better serve our interests. And I have no doubt that the summit process will continue to evolve too. And that is a very good thing if we keep it constructive. And it's a critical thing if we are to harness the hemisphere's huge opportunities for the sake of our common success in the 21st century. Thank you very much. I would like to ask a question um, regarding your dance moves on the floor in Cartagena. Um, I would like to ask you a question seriously about uh, your vision for the hemisphere as regards uh, social inclusion and what you think, you mentioned it in your comments, but what you think this means going forward for how uh, this administration and the private sector can be working together to further expand that. I think, you know, we've talked a lot about the importance of social inclusion, uh, the importance of governmental policies that open opportunities to the widest range of people. But there are some very concrete opportunities, I think, for private sector engagement, um, working both with governments and independently. Um, one of the ones that I mentioned, which I am particularly passionate about and which I think can really be a game changer in this hemisphere, is 100,000 strong for the Americas. And I think that we have seen that demonstrated most dramatically in our partnership with Brazil, where President Rousseff has begun the Science Without Borders program. We saw 650 students arrive in this country in January to begin that process. But we also have had programs over the years, like our Youth Ambassadors program, which just celebrated its 10th anniversary and which struck me when I spoke with that class of youth ambassadors who are high school students, not college students. What struck me about that group was not just how excited and motivated they were to go home and implement projects in their communities, but how incredibly diverse the group was from all over Brazil, um, of every ethnic background, girls and boys, in just about equal components, I think, um, and how much they reflected the diversity of Brazilian society and how much they enjoyed engaging with the diversity of American society. And what we need to do, because we all know that right now is not a great time in the United States for new government programs, 
So 100,000 Strong for the Americas is not a new government program. But we are looking for partners. We are looking for partners in the private sector who would like to sponsor scholarships, who would like to make sure that those scholarships reach kids who might not have had an opportunity to study in the United States. And that includes community colleges, one-year programs. Those are the way we reach out to new and expanding pools of talent in each of our countries. And I want to suggest that all of you can find ways. I know that many of you have big programs in corporate social responsibility already. And what I'm asking you to do is think about taking on one more burden, in a sense, which is to think about expanding those into educational areas. And there are a number of organizations already set up where you can sponsor programs that result in a real difference for kids who might not have had that before. Is there any others? Or just one? One other quick one? Nobody has any questions. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, Roberta, we'll thank time. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.